Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed. I'm Arjuna and this is the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. Today, oh, I forgot to bring him into the stream. That's embarrassing. Okay, today I've got Ryan Mullins on and uh, maybe you could start talking while I bring you into the stream. So thanks for coming on. <laughs> sure. Okay, I'm bringing on Liz Jackson instead of me. Yeah, um, I'll fix that. That's all right. Sick. So uh, we've got, you can, you can learn, he's been on the channel before. You can learn about him in the description and you can start out by telling us uh, what a concept of God is. And this will only take a mm -hmm. second. Sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, so the concept of God I take to involve two different components. So the two different components are that whatever God is, God is going to be absolutely perfect. So God's going to be a perfect being. And then the second major component of the concept of God is that God is the foundation of reality. There's a lot of different ways you can understand what does it mean for God to be perfect? What does it mean for God to be the foundation of reality? But those seem to be like very much agreed upon uh, in terms of whatever the concept of God is. And, and, I, and I take that to be across the world's religions as well, that that's part of the, what the concept of God is. And what's a model of God? So a model of God is going to look at both of those components. It's going to say, I'll give you a unique story about what it means for God to be perfect. Uh, so I'll give you a list of attributes that might, that'll make God perfect. That'll explain why God's perfect. And then I'll give you some sort of unique story about what it means for God to be the foundation of reality. And there's different accounts of that. So it might be a doctrine of creation out of nothing. It might be something like a doctrine of emanation or eternal creation, but there's different ways of spelling that out. And then I should also say, I guess, what a model of God is not doing. So a model of God is just a claim about God. It's just a claim about what makes God perfect and what makes God the foundation of reality. It is not a systematic theology. It's not a, a like philosophical worldview. So I guess let me give you an example of this. So people like um, uh, like Aquinas and uh, and Saint Augustine and Moses Maimonides are supposed to be all classical theists, and we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. But they have all sorts of major disagreements about about other things because so for instance a Maimonides is, is Jewish and Augustine and Aquinas well they're 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 Catholic so they're going to have different understandings of the way the world works they can have different understandings of uh, religious practices and religious doctrines but they're supposedly affirming the same model of God so really needing to emphasize that a model of God is just one piece of your worldview it's not your whole worldview it's not your whole philosophical system it's just one piece of your worldview it's going to inform your, your theology. It's going to inform your philosophical worldview, but it's just that one piece, just telling you what is it for God to be perfect and how is God the foundation of reality? So how is a model different from a concept? So the concept is just saying, so there's concept and then there's conceptions. So you see this in ethics, for instance, they'll say the concept of justice is about giving people what they deserve. And then they're like, the conceptions are like re uh, redistribution. That's, that's, that's part of what it means to be uh, like just or distributive justice or, um, and so they'll kind of lay out these different accounts of like, like thicker detailed accounts of like what justice is supposed to be instead of just giving people what they deserve. So you do this. So I'm doing the same thing with the concept of God. So the concept of God is just that thing that's perfect and is the foundation of reality. And then the model is going to say, okay, well, what does it mean to be perfect? Uh, let me tell you uh, some specific attributes that make God perfect. Uh, and then let me give you a thicker story about how God's the foundation of reality. Does God create the universe out of nothing? Uh, much people in the West want to say yes. Does God eternally create instead? Or is like maybe just emanate? Much people in the East want to say, no, that's how it is. So they're going to have these thicker detailed accounts. It's like fill in that story of that concept. So a concept might be a few buzzwords and then a model will tell us what those buzzwords mean. Exactly. Yeah. And you see this a lot in philosophy of science as well, where they lay out some, some big idea, but then you'll have all these different theories or, or that kind of try to actually give some meat on those bones. So you're not left with just like some really vague kind of statement. Right. So I could come to you with some statements from Bhagavad Gita and you could call it a concept of God. But then if, <laughs> if I wanted to bring that into an analytic philosophical context, I would need to really draw that out in a robust sense and answer objections. And then it would be called a model. Right. Yeah. So you could point to a bunch of passages in the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and elsewhere where it's going to say God's supreme. God's like the greatest, you know, uh, he's, and, and he's like, and you're like, okay, cool. I got that idea of like, he's perfect. 
okay, well, 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 what does that mean? And then you can point to other passages in the Bhagavad Gita where like, well, he's the Supreme Person. He knows all these things. And now you're starting to give some content here. So right. you've got this shared agreement of like the concept, but giving some content, that's, that's where things are going to get interesting. Right. And so there's various different models of God, but what is it that nobody's arguing about? What are they all agreeing on? So most of the models of God that I'm aware of will agree that um, in terms of like what it means to be perfect. So they'll say things like God is omniscient. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. Uh, he's going to be perfectly rational. He's going to be perfectly good. Uh, and then they'll typically want to talk about God having perfect freedom. There's some other attributes too that nobody seems to really be debating about too much, uh, such as what might be called God's aseity uh, or his independent existence. So God's existence is not dependent upon anything else because he's the foundation of reality. So he's not going to be dependent on anything. He's going to, things are going to be dependent on him. Uh, and, and then uh, another claim is typically something like self-sufficiency, which is that God's perfections, whatever perfections they are above and beyond like omniscience, omnipotence and freedom and perfect goodness. Uh, whatever those perfections are, God's not going to get those perfections like derived from something else. Because again, God is the foundation of reality. So everything's supposed to be dependent upon him. So he's not getting his perfection from somewhere else. He just is the source of his own perfection or he just is perfection itself. And so he's going to be the source of all the things you see in reality. So I've got some goodness. I've got some wisdom. Well, God's supposed to be the source of those things. That's typically what people agree on. Um, in... Okay, here's one that's sort of agreeable and disagreeable, that God's a person. You see within a lot of major uh, thinkers within the, within the Indian philosophical traditions and then within um, the Western philosophical traditions, typically want to say God's a person or at least one person because Christians want to say God's three persons. Um, but there are some different thinkers that pop up here and there in both Western and Eastern traditions that want to deny that. They want to say God's not a person, but then they'll still say that God's like conscious, that God like knows all the stuff and that God's in a state of like pure bliss. And those things sound like things that only a person has. So that one, that one's a little bit more difficult to say it's uncontested or that everybody agrees on. That's in the Eastern tradition. That's one of the biggest contentions there. Like, Shankaracharya took it really so you can't even have an experience of bliss in a perfect state because then you've got uh, a, a quality that, that that's supposed to be completely devoid of all quality and uh, right yeah so you know sometimes it's said that the, the the perfection that you achieve on this model it's compared to the the bliss you get when you're going to sleep because there's a kind of bliss in going to sleep there's something that it's like so uh, I mean, personally, I find that kind of incoherent. One time, there was a being that's kind of behind the, there's no God, but the Buddha, he's, he's, he's omniscient, or at least knows enough to, to get you some salvation, uh, some liberation. So yeah, omniscience, it's, it's pieced together in lots of different ways, and it becomes very important in a lot of different uh, debates within Indian philosophical systems. So yeah, that's, that's, that seems like a really secure one to say that like, pretty much all models of God seem to be agreeing that, that omniscience is in the mix. So you've probably looked at Pure Land Buddhism where it's kind of like theism, except if you tell that to a Buddhist, they'll be really <laughs> Yeah, they'll be very, very upset. They'll be like, no, 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 no. And you're like, okay, so there's this thing. There's this being. It's pretty cool. It creates this heaven uh, where I can go uh, and then give me some grace to help me get there. You're like, yeah, 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 but it's not a god. No, 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 no. I'm like, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, we, we, you've got some Buddhists who, who tell you that chanting the name of the Supreme Buddha is the sole salvic vic pressed practice in the Dharma ending age, which we're currently in. And then in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, we've got Sri Chaitanya telling us that, well, it's, it's actually in one of the um, Upanishads somewhere, Harinama, Harinama, Eva Kevalam, Kalo, Nashtaeva, Nashtaeva, Gacharanyata. Uh, it's repeated three times in both parts that in, this, in, in the age of Kali, this dark age we're in, the only way is to chant God's holy names. So it's really consistent between the two. Yeah, one it really of does sound very consistent. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I, one of them is like, "There's no God." I'm I'm into perennialism, so I love all that kind of thing. Um, so you got the omni traits, and then you mentioned the personalism, which is oh, was there another one you mentioned? Yeah, so I mentioned personal, um, but like, but I said, like, there's you've that's, got that's some debated. some major thinkers in each tradition that kind of go, uh, but I don't want that. And you're like. Okay. Okay. Um, but if you got omniscience and omnipotence, then 
power and knowledge seem like things persons have, but okay, whatever. We'll set that one aside. <laughs> oh yeah. You've got, uh, you've got and the then, new, new yeah. agers who are like, the, the universe will answer your prayers and, and the universe cares about you and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, does that mean the universe is a person? Because <laughs> it sounds like this. Exactly. You're right. Because like answering prayers, uh, answering or you're, you know, you write uh, the things you want to request to the universe on, a, on your board or whatever it is. Uh, that sounds like something only a person can do. It sounds like you are engaged in person-like language. So I think consistency really does push us a lot towards more personal understandings of conceptions of God. But um, that, that and then you get into the debates about free will. Yeah, That Go would ahead. be a second category of, you know, there's, there's people who explicitly claim this and they're all agreeing on this. And there's people yes. who, if you piece together their claims, this is sort of an entailment of their view, even though they will mm -hmm. deny it on the surface. Right. Yes, that's exactly right. Because you will find people who go, no, no, it's not God or ultimate reality is not a person. It just has all these attributes that we typically say a person has. So yeah, yeah. Well, then they get into the anurvachaniya stuff, which is the Sanskrit for cannot be described with words. Oh, right. Okay. So, so things that are ineffable or unspeakable, undescribable. And then we get into a 300 page book on describing the undescribable. Yeah, I had an exchange yeah. with, with Samuel the other uh, today. That's still going on about he posted something about God being the ground of all being, and I'm like, so if if God is the, is God the ground of all personhood, does that mean God is the supreme personality? Like, surely to be the ground of something, you need to have the qualities of the thing which you're grounding. And then he gave this analogy of J.R.R. Tolkien, who's the author of you know the book uh, Lord of the Rings. So his, he's the source, he's the ground of being for Middle Earth and all those characters, yet he himself does not possess the qualities of all those characters in that land. But the trouble with that analogy is Middle Earth exists in imagination, as do all those characters. And J.R.R. Tolkien's imagination has all the qualities of those characters in that world. So then I told him, your analogy fails here. And he's mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, analogies are imperfect, you know. So then he got into this whole... Um, what, what, what is it? Equivocal? Is that the... uh, uh, equivocal language. Yeah. Equivocal. yeah. We, we can't speak. About so where you God, mean two different things by the, by the same word, which to me is kind of like, um, Oh, right. Uh, our nerve virginia again, you know, it's ineffable. And then it's like, well, your analogy right. really defended your point. Cause actually your analogy defends my point. J.R.R. Tolkien is a person. It takes a person to create this imaginary world, but sure. You can say that's just a separate part of the analogy, but it takes an imagination which has the qualities of an imaginary world in order to create an imaginary world. If if you've got, you know, let me know when you've got an author creating a real world. Mm -hmm. Right. So a point, so one point that, uh, to like, I think it's worth il illustrating here or, or, or talking about a little bit more is, so all analogies break down, like everybody agrees on that. But when you're using an analogy in a theological or philosophical debate, you want the analogy to not break down at the precise point that you're trying to illuminate. So if you're trying to illuminate how a non-personal being can create stuff, you do not want to use the analogy of a person creating stuff because that is the exact opposite. So it breaks down at the precise point that you're trying to illuminate and you're like, oh, well, you gave me the exact opposite. Well, what he was trying to illuminate, what the, what the analogy was supposed to show is that something can create something or be the ground of being for something without having the qualities of the thing that's created. Mm -hmm. But his analogy didn't show that because you've got an imagination which has the qualities of, of an imaginary world creating an imaginary world, and there's, there's no mm -hmm. new qualities coming into existence. Right, because the kind of thing that a personal God is, is the sort of thing that can have a, a vivid imagination of all the possible ways things could be, uh, and all the possible things that it could bring about. Yeah, so, so you've got all the expl explanatory powers is going on is the very nature of what a personal being is. So the way I've heard uh, Vaishnava, you know, Harry Krishna thinkers break this mm -hmm. down is, you know, so the debate in the tradition is, you know, what is the quality of the absolute? Is the absolute devoid of all qualities, like the Advaitins want to argue, like Sankaracharya and you know people on that side of the debate? Uh, and and what does that mean if God's devoid of all qualities? Well, what ends up happening with that is the reality becomes a mystery. So you you place the you place the mystery exactly where it shouldn't be in the creation, uh, because it's like well, if the creation has no qualities, where do all these qualities come from? Oh, well, they're just 
uh, they're not real. They're both real and not real. And they get into, it's like, well, we don't, how can something both be real and not real? And they, they get into this whole debate around it, which we can't really get into, but I can link anyone to lectures which cover this in great detail if anyone's interested. Uh, but then but then it's like, well, what happens if we do the opposite? What happens if we take all the qualities we find everywhere and we just layer those on the absolute and we just put all the qualities there? Well, then suddenly this material world becomes explicable, but we place the mystery in God. And what does is, what is an absolute being look like that has all these qualities layered, layered onto it? Well, it would be a personal being, first of all. It would have all these shaktis, as the Sanskrit word for kind of like powers or energies. Mm. And uh, basically, you've, you've got a really um, in-depth description of God and his expansion and qualities within the Vaishnava tradition. Um, little tangent. <laughs> So, yeah, so the personhood's debated, as we've discussed. Uh, any more that nobody argues about? Obviously, that's one that people argue about. Um, so there's, there's a lot of people want to say part of an entailment from being all-knowing and all-powerful is that, that God is going to be perfectly rational and perfectly free. So if you've got, uh, if you know all the things and you're all-powerful, you're going to be perfectly responsive to reasons. Um, because if you're not perfectly like responsive to reasons, well, that's, why would you, why would you do that? Like maybe you don't know all the things, uh, and it also, you wouldn't be very powerful. You'd actually be weak. Um, it'd be a liability to not be responsive to reasons. And if you have all the power and all the knowledge and you're perfectly responsive to reasons, well, that's supposed to give you perfect freedom because part of what it means to be free is you perform actions for a reason uh, so if God's perfectly reasonable and he's, he should be able to be perfectly free and nothing should be able to get in his way, uh, to perform whatever thing he wants to bring about because he's all powerful. Um, so, but where some of the debates are going to come up when we talk a bit later about the different models of God is what exactly is the extent of that knowledge? What exactly is the extent of that power? And what exactly is the extent of that freedom? Because, um, where the debates start to get kind of interesting is a lot of people want to say like, yeah, God's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's got all this freedom. But what are the logical limits of that? Uh, or what are the metaphysical limits of that? Can God know the future? Mm -hmm. Depends what kind of world God creates. Can God, um, uh, is God free to create a universe or not create a universe? I don't know. Maybe it depends what kind of, what other things you want to say about God's goodness. Maybe God's goodness entails that God has to create. So those are, so they're agreeing on certain sets of attributes, but how they develop them and the entailments of them, that's where things start to get kind of interesting. Right. So people agree that God's a Sadie, you know, he's not relying on anyone else for his power or existence. They agree on the omni attributes, tri a triple O God. Uh, mm -hmm. They debate his personhood and they agree that he should be rational and free. Mm -hmm. Any more? Um, those are the big ones. Oh, yeah, sweet. Um, cool. So, yeah, so there's we... necessary existence, but yeah, but, but that's kind of all already in, built into Osadi a lot of times. Right. So the next thing would be to go through some of the models of God, starting with classical theism, which I guess is the okay. most discussed. Yes, it's, it's the most discussed in a lot of Western philosophy. So, so classical theism has four unique attributes. Uh, that, that they want to say, in addition to all the other attributes we've identified, they're going to say there's four more attributes that explain why God's perfect. And then they're going to have a particular story about how God is the foundation of reality. So I'll say how God is the foundation of reality. Yes, it's going to be something shared in common with um, the, the next two um, uh, models of God. So they want to affirm something called creation ex nihilo. So when we say that God is the foundation of reality, uh, on classical theism claim is God creates the universe out of absolutely nothing. There's no pre-existent material stuff from which God fashions the universe in any sort of way. Create any number of things or free to create nothing whatsoever. That's all built into the doctrine of creation out of nothing. And then for whatever reason, God decides to create this universe or maybe a multiverse, I don't know, um, affirms. So the four unique attributes that classical theism affirms that are supposed to explain why God is perfect are God is timeless everywhere via his power and his knowledge because he's causing all the stuff to exist and he knows that he's causing all the stuff to exist. So he's supposed to be present there somehow. But you can't make that claim too strongly because then you have God existing now. So if he's present to this moment, well, it seems that he exists at this moment. 
so you get a conflict with standard accounts of omnipresence because you can't have God existing right now. So is that that sounds kind of like saying something is real and bo- both real and not real. It's, well, it's, it's God neither exists at all times nor doesn't exist at all times. Like, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you 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 see this in Anselm. Anselm is like, God, you are everywhere. You're present everywhere, uh, but you're also not present anywhere. Um, and then all things are present to you. And, and he's yes, yeah, so he's got he's got this way of talking where you're like, oh, okay, mm, hang on, whoa, okay, looks like a contradiction, and he tries to remove the contradiction, and I don't think he does. Um, but yeah, and then in other thinkers like Augustine and Aquinas, I mean, they just they just flat out say like, yeah, you know, God doesn't exist right now. God's you know just exists in this timeless present. But then they'll also talk about God being present everywhere at all times and all all places. So it's it's hard to figure out how to remove a contradiction like that. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to do a future one with with Krishna Sajjaswami, also known as Kenneth Valpy, where we'll go into the Hare Krishna conceptions of God and we can get his take on whether Krishna is timeless or not. I've described it to you. And yeah. You, you, you think that what, what we're talking about in the spiritual world is just is still time. It's just we've taken away the fact that time is destroying you know that how the way time in the material world as as described in Bhagavad Gita is the devourer of all things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love the descriptions there. The Bhagavad Gita, it really, it's really cool. Just like like uh, time is the devourer, uh, the destroyer, the death, um, and then because it's just really heavy metal. Like that's really cool. Uh, and then God <laughs> is supposed to be all, like all that as well. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So it sounds like a similar project I'm up to with wanting to uh, something we could talk about a bit later. Um, with the other models of God is what I'll call the identification view where you identify time with God or make time an attribute of God. Um, so we'll, t- we'll get into that in a little bit later right. if you want. If you want. Cool. Mm-hmm. So classical themes, and you said there's four, timelessness, immutable, simple, and... Impassable. So yeah, let's talk about immutability. So, so if God is going to be timeless, I said God can't have any succession. And that fits really well with immutability, which is the claim that God cannot change intrinsically or extrinsically. Uh, so if you, any kind of change is going to bring about a before and after, it's going to bring about succession. And so in the middle ages, in the Western world, like identifying something as having succession, like that's really saying like that's temporal. It's going to have a change. It's undergoing change. So God, if God's really gonna be timeless, he better be completely unchanging. Now, um, impassibility, impassibility makes three, uh, really strong claims. So first God cannot suffer. It is impossible for God to suffer. Uh, second, it is impossible for God to be moved or influenced in any way by anything outside of uh, uh, God. So nothing about you, nothing about the world, nothing whatsoever outside of God can make God feel, think, act, or be in any particular way. So is this Christians claiming this? Yes, this is a very Christian view. Aren't those yeah. the same people that claim Jesus suffered on the cross for us? Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. Um, so there's so here, so let me finish out the, the okay, claim and then, then we'll address this because it's I think it's a very serious problem. Uh, so so God can't suffer. Uh, nothing can influence or move or uh, or impact God in any way, shape, or form. And then God can have any emotion that is perfectly rational, perfectly moral, and then consistent with God's perfect happiness. So the claim is that God is in a state of pure bliss or pure happiness, felicity. There's a lot of kind of words like this that will get thrown around. And that, that happiness is based entirely upon God's evaluation of himself. So God, so to, to be happy is to be in a right relationship with the greatest good. God is the greatest good. So he's going to be perfectly happy because he's in a right relationship with himself. And nothing can move God from that state of happiness because nothing can influence him in any shape, any way, shape or form. So any emotions you want to say that God has, uh, they better be consistent with that perfect happiness. So does God have wrath? Is he angry? Uh, some Christians want to say, yeah, there's a kind of happy wrath or happy anger you could have. And some others want to go, that's just nuts. No, 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 no. God does not literally have wrath, maybe metaphorically, but no. Does God have empathy? No. Metaphorically, sure. But literally, no, no. Um, because God's in the state of happiness and can't be moved or influenced. Um, so now, yeah, so the incarnation stuff. So here's where things get complicated really fast. So the claim is from uh, the classical Christian tradition is that 
in Jesus Christ, there is one divine person, and this one divine person has a divine nature and a human nature. And they're somehow united in some interesting way such that there, is, there are not two, two people there. And so the claim is the divine nature, so the God the Son's divine nature is impassable. It cannot suffer. It cannot be caused or influenced in any sort of way to be, think, feel, or act in any particular way. Whereas the human nature, the Son can suffer in his human nature. So the human nature is doing the suffering. Let me make... That sounds like you might be able to get out of the contradiction. Let me make the problem more precise so you can't easily get out of the kind that has its own thoughts, its own beliefs, its own will. And then there's this human nature, which has a immaterial soul and a, and a physical body. This immaterial soul has its own thoughts, its own beliefs, its own feelings, its own emotions, and its own will. So you've got the divine mind, completely impassable, having its own thoughts, like I'm in a state of pure happiness. And then you've got this human soul that is having thoughts like, whew, this is really awful suffering on this cross right now. Uh, and then somehow these are supposed to, these two minds with each with their own will, their own thoughts, their own beliefs, their own feelings are supposed to be the same person. Right. That's the classical Christian claim. So are you not a fan of dial theism? No, no. Maybe you can tell them uh, what that yeah, really any, means. Are you so talking about like um, like paraconsistent logic or the yeah. or the claim that Christ has two wills? Well, well, yeah, yeah. as it relates. Oh, as it relates to this, yeah, because yeah, there, there's a new book that came out um, where it's saying like you could have logical contradictions every now and then as long as you don't have too many. Uh, uh, but uh, the incarnation, like that, hey, that's a great case of the, of, of having a logical contradiction. Whereas I think. <sighs> Any debate setting, if I walk into a room trying to debate, say, like, a, a, like any like Hindu thinker or Buddhist or Jainist or whatever, and they're like, okay, tell me about your, your belief system. And I'm like, well, my belief system has, at the very heart of it, a logical contradiction. Do I even need to say any more before I've already lost the debate? <laughs> right, yeah. I mean... Obviously, every worldview has got to appeal to mystery at some point. Like I was saying earlier about, you know, the 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 advice of Vadis, the you know, the Shankaracharya followers, they place the mystery in the material world where it shouldn't be. Whereas, you know, obviously God's going to be mysterious. But then, if you're comparing two different theologies, and one of them's got this logical contradiction, the other one doesn't have it. All things being equal, one of them wins. Um, mm -hmm. So, oh know, yeah as few contradictions as possible and you, you know you and then placing that contradiction or the mystery that the inexplicability in, a, in the most appropriate place and then you've got the worldview that wins well okay so i want i want to make a slightly different claim mysteries are not supposed to be contradictions right yeah, mysteries okay. are supposed to be paradoxes right exactly yeah so it's the sort of thing where it's like it's a mystery to me how it's not a contradiction like that's supposed to be the claim uh, and then you can throw around your unspeakable mysteries and, and God's undescribable um, in order to kind of hide the fact that you don't know how to remove the, co the contradiction. Whereas this view that I just laid out where you've got a contradictory Christ, that view, actual case of a logical contradiction. So if you, if I try to point out contradictions in your view and you keep going, well, there's no contradiction there. It's a mystery. Whereas if I came in with this uh, contradictory Christ, I would be saying, no, there's no mystery at all. There's just a logical contradiction. Right. Yeah, I can see the difference. Yeah, there, yeah. So yeah, so I think I think it's bad. Yeah, you do get Harry Krishnas who will make similar claims and say these statements here in the scripture. This is an actual contradiction. It's actually both God both walks and doesn't walk, and you get various things like that. And to me, that's just poetic license being taken by the scripture, mm -hmm. you know, by by the divine state. Really, what it means is there's a sense in which God doesn't walk, and there's a sense in which God does walk and get your head around that and you know this is something to meditate on and it's a beautiful way of saying it yeah I, that seems right to me I, I i think when i look at a lot of different scriptures and different traditions they're they're engaged in a lot of poetry a lot of metaphor to make very particular literal points that they want you to meditate on and focus on so that, yeah I, th I think that's i think it's that seems right to me yeah but then the pushback will be you've just got too much faith and you know, mental sure. <laughs> gymnastics and, you know, and analytic thinking. But 
I, I don't know where it is yet. Um, I haven't found it. Sometimes people tell me they found it. And I'm like, nah, nah, keep going, keep going. I, I, I have this. Ca- These other things in the world. Just say there's only one category. There's just properties. That's it. What do you think of that? And I was, and I, and I, 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 I was so surprised that I actually was kind of rude. And I, and I said, am I supposed to take that view seriously? <laughs> uh, and they're like, yeah, you know, people have published on it. And I was like, cool. Okay. Uh, I, but still, to this day, I think that would still be my response is, am I supposed to take that seriously? Like, why should I bother taking that view seriously? Uh, so yeah, there's, it is one of those things where only an analytic philosopher would be like, well, let's entertain this. I'm like, I'm, I'm willing to entertain a lot of like wild, crazy, skeptical, like, uh, like uh, speculative views, but I do draw my lines somewhere uh, and saying everything's a property. That's one of my lines where I'm like, no, well, just no. Why bother with that? Then you get the other extreme, which is there's only matter. I actually, I was arguing with someone in a, a comments under one of my videos and they were telling me qualia doesn't exist. The qualia would be identical with properties, right? In one sense. Uh, yeah, there's something that it's like to, yeah, your experiential uh, uh, qualities, your properties, yeah. And they said qualia doesn't exist. There's no such thing as green. I'm like, what do you mean? You walk outside your door and you see 10 green things. Like, oh yeah, but they don't, the green doesn't actually exist. It's like, I mean... So that's the other extreme. It's like, I, I, I like to bring mm-hmm. up that point about solipsism and, and what well, quality it's epistemically, yeah. it's an epistemic point that, you know, our, the first thing we know about is qualia, the content of our experience. And then matter, you know, that the, the thing which these properties emanate from is actually a theory. It just happens to be a good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That seems right to me. Yeah. Anytime people start to, uh denying qualia or or even if they go the other way and start denying that the physical world exists i just i just kind of i feel like that's that's where i, I kind of bow out and i'm like okay I, i'm yeah. ready to entertain some views that i think are a little bit more plausible but yeah well, yeah I, so i do think it, it is the case you're right yeah the an analytic can go too far sometimes it's an interesting dialectic move to make when arguing for an epistemology which can give us a spiritual world or the existence of god because it's like well how do you know matter exists you know it with your intuition it's self-evident to you. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, the way it appears to you tells you that it exists. In a similar way, God can appear in your heart or you know, you can have certain sensations of the truth value of certain statements. There's a statement, uh, the Sanskrit phrase, swata pramana, uh, a statement which proves itself. So I guess that means when you hear it, it just rings true. You just know in your heart mm-hmm. this, this statement is true, this propositional statement. Of course, epistemology is heavily debated and I'd get heaps of pushback on that if I had an actual epistemologist. Right. <laughs> sure. But yeah. But thankfully uh, I'm not an epistemologist, so I'm I'm happy to be like, yeah, whatever, sure. Um so we can moving along. Um where were you? Okay. So so we talked about impassibility. Let's talk about simplicity and then we can move on to the other models of God. So uh, simplicity is a really strong claim. It says that God has no properties, no attributes, uh, no imminent universals, no tropes, you know, any of these sort of things, all your property talk it like doesn't really to. apply to God because it does. And this is something that you would have in common with uh, thinkers like Shankara. Uh, like you're going to see this kind of claim, like, qualityless Brahma. And you're like, right, okay. Now you've been talking to Augustine over here. Um, you know, like uh so that's so that's the claim. All of God's as here's some way it'll be sometimes it's articulated in order to emphasize no properties, no, no qualities, none of this sort of stuff. So all of the attributes you want to say God has, omnipotence, omniscience, freedom, whatever, those are all identical to each other. And then identical to God. And identical to God's existence. And then all of God's actions are identical to each other, such that there's only one act. And then this act is identical to God's existence. And then further, God has no potential whatsoever. God's supposed to be purely actual because any potential would supposedly, well, that will, moving from potential to actual involves a change. So, so you know, we've already said that God on this model of, is supposed to be unchanging. So you've got to get rid of any potential in God. It has to be purely actual. There's no other ways God could be. So that's that's classical theism. It's it's very it's very strong, very strong claims. So my view is that this classical VS view seems to have a lot in common with Shankaracharya. But what I find with Shankaracharya is he takes it all the way, fleshes it out in detail, and embraces all of the entailments of it. Whereas I think with the Christians there's some inconsistencies 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are a bunch of arguments, actually, even in the Western tradition as well, trying to say, give me any classical attribute you want. Uh, give me some omnipotence. Give me some omniscience. Give me simplicity. Give me uh, timelessness. You name it. I'll develop an argument from that to pantheism. Uh, so there's a, there's a long tradition of this in the Western world. And then, of course, like you've got Shankar doing something similar. So yeah, I think you can make that, that case. So for instance, earlier, I, I pointed out that the classical tradition wants to say that God's free. And when it comes to creation ex nihilo, they want to say there's God all alone and God is free to create or not create. And God's free to create that universe or any other universe um, if he wants. Or just say, like, I'm not doing anything. But if you've got simplicity in the mix, God's actions, his intentions to create this universe, that's identical to his existence. So God necessarily exists, and anything identical to his necessary existence is going to be necessary. So God can't fail to create. Otherwise, his will and his actions are not identical to his existence. So you'd have the necessity of creation, which is a denial of creation out of nothing. And that is no longer going to be uh, cl classical theism. It's going to be look something more like maybe panentheism or maybe pantheism. And then I've got some other arguments I've developed uh, in my first book, uh, The End of the Timeless God, where I try to look at some claims about um, and some different classical theists where they'll say God's ideas about the world, that's just what the world is. We just are God's ideas. Well, if God's ideas are identical to God, given divine simplicity, then the world is identical to God. And that's going to look exactly like Shankara's view. It's going to look like pantheism. Right. So the, one of the arguments given against Shankaracharya's view is that if God doesn't have any qualities, where do the qualities come from? And then they say, oh, well, the qualities don't actually exist. That's how they get around that mm -hmm. one. And it's like, what does it mean for the qualities to not actually exist? Oh, well, it's it's not that they don't exist. It's not that they do exist. It's that they both do and do not exist. And it's like, well, that's totally incoherent. We 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 have no right. My, uh, analogy is heavily used in the debates in the tradition. So, you know, you you demonstrate a principle as possible to exist in reality by showing an example of it. If you can't show any example of your mm -hmm. principle, then you fail. So that we have no example of something both existing and not existing, and it's a logical contradiction. So that's one argument Ramanujacharya gave against it. He gave I think seven arguments, and then Madhvacharya wrote a dissertation or whatever you want to call it, a treatise mm -hmm. against Shankaracharya's view, which the followers of Shankaracharya to this day are still debating. And he forced them mm. to, to revamp their views. I don't know if you've studied any of this. You might find it interesting. A little bit. So, cause I, cause I know as a, as a, uh, Madhva comes up with what, what, like five distinctions between God and everything else. Uh, and then tries to like develop arguments for each of those distinctions to say, you have to have this. You can't really explain everything being identical to, to God. Yeah, so Ramanujacharya had what's translated as qualified non-dualism, uh, Vaishya right. Advaita. Madhvacharya had real hard dualism. He's like, no, us and yeah. God are totally separate. And then yeah. in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, we have a chincha beta beta tapa, which is simultaneous, inconceivable, simultaneous oneness and difference. Some people argue it's a contradiction. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, like Prabhupada would give an example and say, you take a drop of water from the ocean. It's the same in quality as the ocean, but it's different in quantity. So we're made out of the same substance as God. We're, we're mm -hmm. sat, shed, and under. We're, we're eternity, knowledge, and bliss. So matter is composed of something ugly. It degrades, it stinks, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it's like dust. But the, our real spiritual identity is sat, shed, and under. In the spiritual world, we have a form composed of Satchit Ananda. God is, whenever he appears in the material world, he's Satchit Ananda. Uh, so we're one with God in that sense. And also one way it's described by Rupa Goswami is you, you need to have a kind of similarity in order to have a relationship with God. You know, like you can't have a deep relationship with your dog the same way you could with, you know, a spouse, a human. Um, so we need to have some similarity with God in order to be able to have a relationship with him. If God's totally different from us, how can we relate to him? You know, if we're just like a snail and God's a person, you can't have a relationship. Yeah, not any interesting kind of relationship uh, at the very least. Yeah, yeah. 
So let's let's um, let's come back to those when we talk about right, panentheism yeah, and pantheism because that's so, that because those are those are the right models to talk about for that. So, for that so back yeah. on um, classical theism, what's the difference between immutability and impassibility? They sound pretty much like the same thing. So, so the claim is supposed to be that these four divine attributes they're systematically entailed. So if you get one, you should be able to get the others. So there should be really close. So mutability is God cannot change intrinsically or extrinsically. Impassibility is primarily a statement about um, God cannot be causally influenced. Uh, and then is and then the main locus of it is about God's emotional life. So something could you might be able to say something can't change intrinsically or extrinsically, but it'd still be like possible that it could be like uh, moved or influenced or causally affected. Um, so here'd be an example. Say um, there's just an atom that exists in the void. Nothing else exists. You might be able to say that's it's immutable because it's not changing intrinsically. It's not changing extrinsically because there's nothing for it to relate to. But if other things existed, well, then it could be. It could be influenced by, say, like another atom pops into existence, then, it, then this first atom could be like knocked around, and so it could be causally influenced. Whereas impassibility uh, wants to go stronger and be like, no, no, it's not what we're talking about, just mere unchanging. Like, it is impossible to be causally influenced. Uh, and it's impossible for God to have any emotion that's unhappy. So when you were talking about that earlier, um, I was thinking it makes God sound somewhat self-absorbed like, in a way that means like we're totally cut off from him. So I've heard one Harry Krishna thinker giving a lecture and explaining, he used this word multivalent, uh, which mm -hmm. means like you have, if you have a room and there's one socket outlet, it's univalent. You can plug one thing into it. Whereas if you have a multi-box, we call them in New Zealand, I don't know what you call them overseas, <laughs> power board, you, you plug it into the socket outlet and you get multiple socket outlets. The, the, the multi-box is multivalent. But, and so God is like this. We're, we're univalent. You know, I'm either absorbed and I'm absorbed in one thing at a time. You know, when they study uh, people who say they multitask, really what they're doing is attention swapping, attention switching. And they say that's yeah. quite taxing and you want to focus on one subject in order to really get absorbed. So the goal with Christian consciousness is to become fully absorbed in God. Uh, but God is cheating on us. We, we can say, I'm fully dedicated to you, God, but God's got, having a relationship with absolutely every living entity because he's multivalent. Mm. He can do that and be fully present and, and fully satisfying for every single person. But this impassable, immutable God sounds like he's just plugged into himself, like a multi-box, which has as many leads as it does socket outlets and all the leads are plugged into itself. So there's no room less for us to plug into. Yes, and I think that's actually uh, very accurate. Um, so the claim is typically something like this. So like I already said, um, God's happiness is grounded entirely in himself. And then the classical theists, when they start talking about how does God know stuff? So they'll say God's omniscient and he knows everything. How does he know it? He knows everything by knowing his own essence. So all God's knowledge is self-knowledge. Uh, because supposedly God's knowledge of himself is even greater than having knowledge of like the, like any particular thing, like knowledge of you. So knowledge of himself is supposed to give him more and better and greater knowledge than actually knowing things based on you. Uh, and then God's love, this is really explicit in a bunch of different uh, thinkers in the Christian tradition. God's love is self-love. It could only be self-love because nothing else has enough value. Uh, so maybe you kind of reflect God's love in some sort of interesting kind of way, but his love is always self-love. What he loves in you is just what he sees in himself. So it's, 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 it is very self-focused and it couldn't, it couldn't be any other way. According to the classical theist, it would be bad if it was some other way, according to the classical theist. I'd say the Hare Krishna rejoinder to that would be that we are tiny sparks of the divine. We're, we're in a sense, God, but we're just tiny little parts and parcels of God. Uh, so when God relates to us, he's relating to something that's as perfect as him. It's just we're tiny little units of the divine rather than, you know, this infinite form of it. Yeah, there's a bunch of different kind of responses. So basically what you're laying out is this idea that you, me, and the other stuff that exists, it has some kind of value. Uh, it does reflect God in some sort of way, but it's not God just loving himself and that's it. It's God saying that has value. That's why I brought it into existence, or that's why I sustained it in existence, because it has value. Uh, so, so on most of the other models, what they want to say if they deny impassibility is that, yeah, there is some kind of valuing going on. God values things other than just Himself. Right. Or, or you could turn around and say we're all identical with God in some sense. And, right. 
Um, so yeah, then self-love, it's no big deal. That's one way of interpreting the Harry Christian side of things too. It's just, mm -hmm. we, we tend to have oh, more right. focus on the separateness because you need that for the relationship. Right. In order to have that sort of personal relationship, you, yeah, yeah. if I'm identical, I, I mean, I can have a personal relationship with myself in some sense. It takes two um, people to have but, a relationship generally. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, so when we're talking about like literal relationship, then it seems like, yeah, that's, that's what I should, I should have more than one person in the room. Yeah. All right. So that's classical theism. And then mm -hmm. neoclassical theism, is that the one that you hold to? Yes. So the neoclassical theist, they're going to agree with the classical theist about, you know, all the omnis and all that kind of stuff. And they're going to agree that creation out of nothing, that's the right story uh, for how God's the foundation of ultimate reality. And then they're also going to agree with you um, that God, God's knowledge, depending on the kind of world he creates, extends to the future. So God has some sort of foreknowledge. What they're going to do is they're going to reject one or more of those four classical attributes. Uh, that, so they're going to reject timelessness, immutability, simplicity, and passability. You're going to reject one or more of those. Personally, I think you should reject all four of those classical attributes, um, but there are a lot of disagreement here. Um, so let me give you an example of this. So if you reject timelessness, you're going to say God's temporal, which means that God exists without beginning and without end because God's an eternal being, but God can undergo succession and God can uh, change in certain ways. Uh, and God can be temporally located. So I could say God exists right now. So God can have like uh, a daily God, routine. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So he's like, wakes up in the morning. He's like, all right, what am I doing? Oh yeah, I'm sustaining a universe. There we go. That's what I was up to. Okay. Uh, and, and he can make plans and he can perform various actions successively to bring about those plans. Uh, so, and then you, if you have that, then it seems like you can't have immutability because you're going to have God changing in certain ways. You're going to have God changing intrinsically as God performs one action and then another. You're going to have God changing intrinsically in terms of God knowing this is what's happening now. Ooh, now, 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 this is what's happening now. Ooh, now this is what's happening now. So God's going to be changing in certain intrinsic ways. And then he's going to be changing extrinsically as he relates to new beings in different ways. Um, now, a lot of them want to, uh, most neoclassical theists, simplicity is the really obvious one to get rid of. Because, so like T.J. Mawson has this, T.J. Mawson wants to say God is timeless. He wants God to be immutable. But when it comes to simplicity, he goes, we should have put a stop to the conversation well before we started saying God's attributes are all identical to each other. He's just like, that's, we just shouldn't even entertain that anymore. Let's just be done with that idea. Uh, and then Linda Zygzebski is another example of this. She wants to get rid of impassibility. She thinks God's passable, which means that God can suffer. God can have, um, can be influenced or moved by things outside of himself. And God can have a range of emotions that are unhappy, but the, but God can only have emotions that are perfectly rational and perfectly moral. So here's, let me give you a, an example of why I think you need to get, get rid of all four of the classical attributes in order to be consistent. So Zygzebski wants to say God's passable, God suffers. When God empathizes with you, God suffers. But she also wants to say that God is timeless and immutable. So think of it this way. Uh, think all the atrocities that happened during the 20th century. And God's like perfectly empathizing with all of those people that are suffering in all these horrible ways during the 20th century. Well, if God's suffering, then he's eternally suffering because he's a timeless being. And then he's immutable, so he's unchanging. So God's locked in this eternal, unchanging state of suffering. And that sounds really terrible. And so I think that's just incoherent. So I think you should get rid of the claim that you, you, I don't think you can just stop by getting rid of impassibility. I think you need to get rid of the other claims too. I think you need to get rid of timelessness. I think you need to get rid of immutability. Otherwise, you're going to have God being in a state of like eternal conscious torment. Right. Yeah, I get that. Um, on so with pass, if God does God being passable necessarily mean that He's suffering? I like to argue that God can you know have you know move emo be moved emotionally by us without it being suffering, just as you you can be performing charity work for people who are suffering and there's a kind of bliss in helping other people even though you know those people are suffering it's just because you're engaged in uplifting them so perhaps god is conducting this whole material affair where you know there is a, an amount of suffering going on 
but he knows it's for our ultimate good and he's actively reaching out to extend mercy to us and uplift us. Therefore, he's not suffering, even though he's moved by our, us. Yes, that's exactly right. That's the right point to make. So sometimes when you're looking at debates about impassibility versus passability, the focus is so much on suffering that it seems like that's all God's doing is just sitting around just like in a state of like just agony. You don't see discussed as often are the statements from passibilists who go, well, but it's only temporary. Um, so like before God creates the universe, God's in a state of bliss. And then he creates a universe knowing that it might bring some pain and suffering along the way. And God's willing to do that. But in the end, it'll be good because God's going to bring about whatever his purpose is for creation. Say like right loving relationships with his creatures. And then you'll have this state of perfect bliss again. Along the way, there might be suffering, but God's suffering is also always going to, he's always going to have his own beliefs, his own emotional evaluation of the situation in view, because he knows what purpose he has for creation and he knows he's going to accomplish it. So whatever suffering God might have, he'll understand this is what it's like for you to suffer. In some cases, he might be like, well, you kind of deserve it. So I don't feel bad at all. In other cases, he might be like, I feel bad for you, but... I know that I have this good plan and I know it's going to be come to completion. So overall, I'm still feeling pretty happy. Um, not like in the state of like pure, like unadulterated bliss, but I still have a sense of like happiness. I still a sense of peace and joy because I know that things are heading in the right direction. Uh, so yeah, so, so you're absolutely right to bring out, there's, a, there's more complexity, I guess, to, to, to God's emotional life than just simply, ah, oh, you're suffering, so therefore I'm suffering. Right. Um, so are there anything the neoclassical theist would replace those four qualities with? Yeah. So if you get rid of timelessness, you're going to replace it with temporality. And so, like I said before, temporality is God being uh, existing without beginning and without end, but God can have succession and God can have temporal location. So he can and have then breakfast. with, yes, he can have breakfast, he could have lunch, he could have dinner. He could even have brunch in the middle if he wants. You know, he's got options. There's things he can do. He's not trapped in this one like timeless moment. Uh, that, yeah, that and sounds, then he would not I mean, be. If you want to say yeah. God's the greatest being imaginable, a God who can have like pastimes, you know, do, do things that he enjoys, mm -hmm. sounds greater than a God who's just kind of like floating in the ether without being able to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because whatever a timeless being is doing, he's just timelessly doing. He doesn't. There's no real sense in which he has options because it's too late in any sort of logical sense to do anything else. Uh, whereas like a temporal being can do one thing and then another and then another and, and so on. And yeah, so he's got a lot of options. You can actually understand God's freedom. You can understand God's experiences if God's temporal. Uh, with immutability, you replace that with mutability. So you would just say that God can change in various ways. God cannot change his essence, so his essential properties can't change. But God can change as he expresses his essential properties. So as he is, so he can express his omnipotence and his perfect freedom in lots of different ways by doing different things. And he changes when he actually does perform free actions. Um, and then impassibility you replace with passability, which we already talked about. Um, and then simplicity, you replace that with what's called unity. So you don't say... God doesn't have any attributes, doesn't have any properties. You say, God does have attributes. He has a bunch of different ones. He has a bunch of essential attributes, and he's got some accidental properties, like maybe being creator, maybe being redeemer. You know, Maybe God wasn't always doing that stuff, so he gets those properties later. Uh, but they're always unified. There's not going to be any contradiction in them. Uh, they're always going to be coextensive, meaning um, you're not going to find God's omnipotence like floating free from God's omniscience. They're not going to be like separable properties. They're not going to be some like parts that can come apart from God. Right. So they don't get in arguments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I wanted to say something about that because in Krishna consciousness, mm -hmm. where there's this idea that, you know, God is identical with his name, form, pastimes, and so on. Uh, Nam, Guna, Rupa, and Leela, name, form. Yeah. Uh, so, but by ident identical, we probably don't mean what the analytic theologian means. Uh, we, we right. Mean That's theology. absolutely correct. Yes. Because, because I know like Ramanuja like was like, has all these weird, like, um, really technical, like semantic points about this sort of thing of saying, sometimes when we talk about identity, what we mean is there's a, a substance that has an attribute and that attribute is not 
uh, separable from the substance. Uh, and so I know there's like a lot of debates like that in, in, in Indian philosophical context. So it's not like the strict identity statements of simplicity. And even like the scripture is said to be identical with God. But what we mean by that is like, you can have like, we, we, we do deity worship. So you can have the murti, the, which is the Sanskrit word for the, the, um, the form in this, like the statue. And you can worship that, or you can worship the Bhagavatam, which is the, the scripture, <clears throat> or you can even worship the holy name. So you can, you can, when you're studying the scripture, you're connecting with God. When you're worshiping the Murti, you're connecting with God. When you're chanting the holy name, you're connecting with God. It's all identical with God. Every one of them is a relationship directly with God. Whereas when we say something's not identical with God, <clears throat> we mean like, you can't worship that thing. You can't have a relationship with that thing and say you're worshiping and relating to God. So is the claim something like this? So when I'm when I'm looking at a particular statue that's supposed to be a representation of uh, of, of God, uh, it connects me to God. So it's so these things are they're right they're identified with God in some sense. Well, it's, it's more than Whereas, connecting. It's it's directly personally mm -hmm. relating to God. So God is present right. in His name. So when you're chanting with the right mood, God will manifest himself on your tongue as the holy name. But like sometimes- oh, Okay, so I'm, I'm having a like, direct encounter with God. Uh, like one analogy that's given is, is um, you know, like God is compared to the king. But, the, you know, to, to go and see the king, you need to be clean. You need to be well-dressed. You know, there's, there's certain qualities, mm. certain bar you need to meet before you can physically, like go directly before the king. So the king comes in another form and says, come and meet the king. But this is actually God also coming in this other form. And, you know, you chant the holy name, you're becoming purified, you're cleaning your heart, you're developing bhakti, and eventually you come to the point where uh, you can have direct relationship with God in his personal form, you know, as Rupa, um, mm -hmm. and his past, enter into his pastimes, which are very personal. You know, God is wrestling with, cowherd, with the cowherd boys in Vrindavan. He's, you know, having... Uh, conjugal, you know, things that are gossiped about with the with the gopis in Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. It's 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 like really the words rasa. It's really deep, and you know, uh, there's conjugal, which is the highest, and then there's uh, parental, but uh, um, and vatsyalia, which is friendship, and then the uh, the fourth one is awe and reverence. Uh, and that's all. Okay, so you're having right. Okay, and so in each of those cases, you'd be like, well, that's God right there. I'm encountering God right there because that's God right there. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the claim. That's the identity claim being made is God's right there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not the identity statements of His attributes are identical to His existence. It's like, well, no, like that statue right there, that's God. These, yeah, this God's, holy name I'm chanting right now, that's God. God's appearing in that form. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So this would be a case of like what you would call like personal identity. Um, so it's not like the because God, that it's God's right there. And you're like, that's the same, the same person I was encountering in this other way. Well, now I'm encountering that same person in this way because God's right there. That's, that's still God right there. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine with divine unity. That would be, yeah, uh, any kind of divine unity would have all of that, would, would allow for all those sorts of statements. Right. So if we were to use- Without having to go with simplicity. The modern philosophy of relig religion language to talk about that, we'd say God is unified or God has unity with his name, form, and so on. Because they're not; these are not things that are separable from Him. Uh, and then, so when God, wherever God goes, all of His attributes are coming with Him. It's not like, like when God comes to to be present in the in the Holy Name, He just leaves like His His uh, power behind. You know, it's not that's not that doesn't make any sense because these attributes are coextensive with God. They have to come with God. Uh, right. Yeah. So yeah, it would be so unity would be the I think the better way to to describe this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a technical use of these words. it's a very technical claim it is yeah yes so when you're doing philosophy of religion you got to know how to talk the talk but but you know and, and when you're yeah. just among harry krishnas or you know speaking to normal people you can use words differently yes you can be uh, you can be more loose and i think i think sometimes a lot of those looser ways of talking we know exactly what people are getting at like it's not it's not that difficult i think for an analytic philosopher to to sit down and go well now what do you really mean by that i'm like you know what they mean you know exactly what they're talking about. Come on. Well, you got to speak in a way that's fit for purpose. So if you're doing philosophy of religion, yes. you need to be extremely pre precise. If you're just trying to explain to ordinary people what this Krishna consciousness is all about, 
then you just speak in a way that they're going to understand. They're not going to understand. You use the <laughs> word unity instead of identical. They might miss the point because it's like unity. They might think right. they understand it in a different way. So uh, <laughs> moving on, uh, is there any more points about neoclassical theism? Uh, that's enough on that. I think we can get into open theism. All right. So what's the hallmark of that? So open theism, so the neoclassical theist, I said, they affirm, um, they agree with the classical theist that you know, all the omnis and that God creates the universe out of nothing. And the open theist says, yes, that's right. So that's all cool. Um, we like our we like our creation out of nothing. That's how God's the foundation of reality. When it came to those four classical attributes, the neoclassical theist says, I'm going to reject one or more. The open theist goes, you have to get rid of all four. Just get rid of all four. That's that, you, that it just doesn't make any sense to have impassibility, but, you know, temporality or to have God be mutable, but, you know, be timeless. You just like, you know, get rid of all four of those and then get rid of God's foreknowledge. So classical theism, neoclassical theism, they want to say God knows the future. The open theist wants to say God can know some things about the future, but he can't have an exhaustive knowledge of the future because God has decided to create a universe where creatures have libertarian free will. And the claim they'll make is part of what it means to have libertarian free will is that the future, what you're going to do with your freedom is unwritten. It is completely unsettled what you are in fact going to do with your free will. So God cannot know for certain what you're going to be doing with your free actions. God can probably know how the future is going to go. He can look at all the possible timelines that branch from this moment and go, that one's more probable than this other one. But which one will in fact happen? The open theist typically says God cannot know that because what creatures with free will just entails um, that the future is completely open. It's not written. There's no, there's no story of the world of how in fact will go. Right. So you'll get some neoclassicalists who will throw out all four of those attributes, but they all want to retain foreknowledge. So is this yes. the only real difference between neoclassical theism and open theism? It's the main big one, yeah, because the, the neoclassical theism says it's so it's so messy because you have these people debating whether or not we should get rid of all four, um, where ebbs, but they're all still committed to creation out of nothing and foreknowledge. With open theism, you get a very clear demarcation of like get rid of all four of those and no foreknowledge, like so it's it's that's the really big demarcating line right there is the foreknowledge claim. Right. So, is there any any other points about that one? Um, this one, I guess to say it's, it's one that it's primarily developed in the Christian tradition in more recent times, but there are some different thinkers supposedly within the Jewish world, um, uh, that you might be able to identify that look like they're proto open theists. Uh, I've heard some people say there's different, um, there's some different Islamic thinkers that might, might've been open theists way back in the day, but I haven't been able to investigate that as much. And then I know that there are some more contemporary Hindu thinkers who seem very interested in the idea at the very least, uh, in, in terms of going, I don't know how to solve the problems related to if God knows the future, how do I have free will? Well, maybe, uh, God doesn't know the future. You see this kind of stuff, uh, discussed every now and then. So it's, it's, it's a model of God that I think could easily fit with a bunch of different world religions, but the, the main place you see it thus far has been within the Christian tradition. Right. And obviously there's a whole debate around the problems for divine foreknowledge for free will and so on, which would be a whole nother mm -hmm. topic. Right. Um, divine foreknowledge. Yeah. So you might get Harry Krishna thinkers who, who want to throw that out. Uh, um, that some pure devotees are called tree kalagya, you know, like at a certain state of spiritual advancement. Uh, tree kalagya means knowing past, present, and future. So kala means time, tree means three, and gya means yeah. knowing. But uh, it's generally described that what's meant by that is they know the past, present, and future in the way we might know the seasons. So, you know, you know, oh. spring's coming, you know, winter's coming, and so on. You don't necessarily know everything's going to happen. So every Kali Yuga, there's certain activities that come on. So, you know, someone makes this restaurant chain called KFC. Next Kali Yuga, somebody else makes a similar kind of restaurant chain, but you don't know who's going to do it and exactly what they're going to call it. But you're going to have all these same kind of sinful activities. I mean, it's sinful in the sense of, you know, slaughtering animals wholesale. Um, <laughs> 
coming up every right. Kali Yuga. So the Kali Yuga, remind me, that's um, it's like the the entire history of, of a particular universe from its beginning to its end and before another universe comes around? Uh, so you get, there's four Yugas. There's Satya, Trecha, Dwapra, and Kali. Uh, mm-hmm. They're progressively less elevated. So Satya Yuga, people live for 100,000 years. They meditate through this, you know, it takes thousands of years, meditate on God and the heart in order to attain spiritual perfection. Uh, Treta and Dwarpa, uh, one of them, the process is fire sacrifices. You get fire sacrifices in every tradition historically. And the other one, it's deity worship. And then Kali Yuga is the most degraded. You know, people are are Mm. short-lived, frustrated, quarrelsome, envious, and always disturbed. Uh, unlucky. Uh, these are the qualities of people in Kali Yuga. And we're so degraded that the only way we can sp- possibly attain spiritual perfection is through chanting God's holy names. Right. Okay. So you've got the claim is like, was it something like it's like, is it the year of the Lord or the day of the Lord is the entire life of a uh, particular so, universe? So, I mean, Lord Brahma is, is a, an empowered creator. He's actually a Jiva soul. Mm-hmm. So anyone could take the post of Brahma, but you have to be extremely qualified. Sometimes there's no sure, soul yeah. qualified enough to do that. So Krishna does it personally. Um, but you've also got m- many different universes. So for every universe, there's a Lord Brahma. My, it seems to be, some thinkers are, are pointing to it being that each universe is actually a solar system. So the mm-hmm. our solar system is governed by Lord Brahma. There's many of them and they all... Uh, so Mahavishnu lies down on the causal ocean and from it, he breathes in, in all of the universes go back into his body. He exhales and all the universes come, come back out. This happens endlessly. So while that's going on, some souls are attaining spiritual perfection, leaving the spiritual world. New souls are falling out of the spiritual world. Of course, that's debated whether they come from the Tatasta right. or fall from the spiritual world. But anyway, uh, new souls are repopulating the material world. So it goes on endlessly. Uh, and then each bubble has a has a Lord Brahma who with it with another Mahavishnu, lotus flower sprouts out of his navel. Lord Brahma comes out, is all confused, gets some instruction from Vishnu how to create Vishnu, being God, God, same as Krishna, just a different manifestation of Krishna, mm-hmm. uh, and instructs him how to create. And then he lives for a hundred years. Uh, one of his days is has. Uh, can't remember how many yugas there are in his day. So a Chatra yuga is four yuga cycles, Satya yuga. So Kali yuga is 432,000 years. The next one is double that. The next one is triple that. The next one is quadruple that. So you've got one point something billion years is a Chatra yuga. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, I can't remember the number of those that you have in a day of Brahma. So it's massive. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Where because half- that's what I loved reading about some of these, uh, these calculations of how you, how you do that. I always thought those were fascinating. Um, but the big claim is, so when you're looking at these different solar systems, uh, they're going to have a similar historical pattern of how they go. You're yeah, going to have these yeah. different ages. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so if you, so, so the claim is no, uh, you're future. not really reaching a state of omniscience. You're just knowing, well, this is just how the history of these things has to go. Uh, yeah, so, so you wouldn't know it, all the details. There could be some degree of prophecy. Like you might know, like oh, mm-hmm. we've got a golden age coming where there's going to be spiritual upliftment, and or you know, so you might know some details a little bit more. So you know, and 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 the elevated yuga, you'll have, you might have a dark period where a dark personality rules for a time, and in the dark age, you might have a golden period where spiritual enlightenment is uh, extolled and uh, goes on widespread for a while so apparently according to the Hare Krishna tradition we're entering a golden age which will run for 10,000 years okay so yeah that would all be consistent with open theism because you because it's like yeah God would be able to know this is the way the ages are going to go and would be able to see pretty clearly this is going to be a, a golden age for a while or this is going to be a, a dark age for a while but all the precise details some of those things would be you know a pr- probably probably the case but not like certainly will be this way uh so there'd be a lot of openness to the way the story is going to go and so that would all be consistent with open theism so an open theist could have the, the, to make all these claims yeah yeah i'm not sure if our scriptures are really explicit on this so you might be able to go either way and say god knows everything we're going to do 
but we're free. It's just God knows which choices we're freely going to do. Or uh, someone might want to say, yeah. God, you know, has a rough idea where things are going to go, but we could surprise, we could go in a slightly different direction. Of course, you wouldn't want to say God is surprised. Right. I, I, I think even on open theism, it, you can't really say God's surprised because he knows what's probably going to happen. And as things get closer and closer to the event, the probabilities go up really high. Yeah. So uh, the idea of God being surprised, I think it's implausible. Uh, so yesterday I was reading um, uh, Arthur Herman's uh, classic book called uh, The Problem of Evil and Indian Thought. And when he comes to this point of looking at the freedom for knowledge problem, he says the texts, the, the like the foundational Hindu texts, they don't really have enough discussion on the, the extent of God's knowledge of the future uh, or omniscience to really give you the details. So he says it's open to different uh, f- uh, Indian traditions to say if they want to go this open theist route or do something or or, or not. He says like the, the, the text themselves, they're, they're, there's not enough content there to really push you in one direction or the other. Well, it would seem weird. But I don't know. I'm not an expert on it, so I don't know. I mean, this seems like just one particular topic and an opinion on one particular mm-hmm. aspect of God. So to say we are open theists just because we happen to have one particular view on one particular aspect of God seems a little odd. You know, then you'll end up with we're open yeah. theists, uh, pan, we're open theists, panin theists, uh, polymorphic. Yep. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, out. exactly. So yeah, so let's get into panentheism then, because then I can talk about how nebulous it is and and you can get some people who are, have this open aspect and then others who go, no. So um, why okay, is it so called pan- panentheism? Yeah. Where, where does that, what's the etymology? So the etymology goes back to this guy in the 1800s named uh, Friedrich Christian Krauss. He was a German thinker that hung out with Schelling quite a bit. Was it Schelling? I think it was Schelling. Um, and so he coins this term panentheism to try to describe that the universe is in God, but God is more than the universe. Uh, that's, that's, that's the big claim. And so this is what uh, Benedict Gurkha is one of the greatest living panentheists. He calls this the catchy panentheistic slogan. So the universe is in God, but God is more than the universe. Now, it's difficult for me to figure out exactly what that means. And I've written a couple papers arguing that it's not clear what that could be. Uh, and then I've been asked to write some papers where to try to give a more detailed analysis of what panentheism should say. So as far as I can tell, panentheism really boils down to two different claims. One unique claim is about how God is the foundation of reality. So they want to say creation ex nihilo, that's false. Uh, God always has to exist with a universe of some sort. So there's some kind of necessity of creation. Uh, That might be an emanation. So maybe the uh, universe or multiverse or whatever, all the cosmic stuff just kind of emanates, necessarily emanates from the nature of God. Or maybe God does eternally create. So God wills, just eternally and necessarily wills that there always be some sort of cosmic stuff. Those seem like the sort of options you have if you want to be a panentheist. So you do not have the claim from creation ex nihilo where God exists all alone. You never get that on panentheism. You, uh, and so creation ex nihilo says God's all alone uh, and then has the choice to create or not create. On panentheism, God's never alone. God's always existing with some sort of cosmic stuff. Maybe it's a bunch of souls. Maybe it's a bunch of souls and prime matter. There's different ways you could de- uh, develop that. But the claim is they're either going to be dependent upon the nature of God or dependent on the will of God. So that's the, the big fundamental claim from panentheist. Then the other big claim from panentheist is the catchy panentheistic slogan that in some sense the universe is in God, but God is more than the universe. And so we can get into some different ways to cash that out, but that, that's I'll pause there for a second. Right. So, I mean, one Harry Krishna phrase, which is used a lot, is uh, God is the universe, but the universe isn't God. Maybe that's used elsewhere too. It is. Yeah. Um, so you see this. Uh, so uh, so Gavin Flood, uh, his book on Hindu monotheism, he says that this is like he gives a bunch of cases of of the, these sort of phrases that you see pop up. And so he says the proper way to really describe Hindu monotheism is typically panentheism. And then he says like, well, you've also got like Shankar and these others where you've got pantheism, where the universe just is identical to God full stop. But the panentheist wants to say there's some sort of really tight relationship between the universe where it's somehow in some sense in God, um, but then but God's more than greater than 
you know, the universe or multiverse or whatever. And you find that vague. Mm -hmm. So here, here's some examples. Um, so Ramanuja wants to say that the universe is God's body. And so this is supposed to be like one of the classic ways of kind of articulating that catchy panentheistic slogan, the universe is God's body. Uh, well, what does that mean? For Ramanuja, it means that um, the universe is God's body in the sense that God knows all the different things about the universe, he knows all the stuff that exists, and he has direct control over all those different bits uh, of the universe. So God is present through power and through knowledge. Uh, and then that's what it means for the universe to be God's body, is that the entire universe or multiverse or whatever is subject to God's knowledge and power. God has some sort of control over it. Well, here's the problem with that view. That is identical to basically everybody's definition of omnipresence. So classical theist, open theist, uh, neoclassical theist, you know, all these different people, that just is their definition of, omniscient, or of omnipresence, that the whole universe is just subject to God's knowledge and power. And well, so God's present in these ways. The difference would be that on an other alternative views, the material energy would be something apart from God. Whereas on the panentheism, mm -hmm. you say that the material energy is Krishna's shakti, it's spiritual energy. Uh, so one, one time, Prabhupada was asked by Allen Ginsberg, he was challenged, uh, so, um, if, you know, Matt, if the, how can God appear in a material form? You know, how can you're worshiping this deity, you're saying the deity is God. How can God appear in a material form? And Prabhupada replies saying there is no material energy. So th this is, mm. uh, you know, a kind of inconceivable part of our theology, you might say, that the, the material energy, it's, it's only our illusion or misunderstanding that makes it seem like we're separate from God, but actually we're connected with God all the time. And when you, you know, become advanced in God consciousness, you can see that everything is God and you're, you can connect with God through everything you do and see mm -hmm. God everywhere. Yeah. So notice what you pointed out though. It has nothing to do with the way God is um, present in terms of knowledge and power. You've said that this energy is just like it emanates from God. It is like a part of God, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, a one of the So that's chapters. the, so, yes. So that is no longer a claim about omnipresence. What we've done is we've switched to that original claim, which is how is God the foundation of reality? Uh, well, all the, all the stuff, the, the cosmic stuff is just an emanation from God. So that's what's doing the work there to demarcate. Um, so Ramanuja's account of, of omnipresence and entailing embodiment, that's not really doing the work. What's doing the real work is that all this stuff is in, in an emanation from God, from like based on just what you just said. So uh, and so like, and that's fine, but it just, it's not really... It's not the the account of embodiment that's doing the work. So it would just go back to the universe just necessarily exists. So is that not panentheism? I will. So my problem is, I think that panentheism it looks like it looks like panentheism. All panentheism really is is just this claim that God has to exist with a universe of some sort. Um, but panentheists tell me there's more to the story. There's more to the story. And then when I keep asking for that more it usually reduces down to something that everybody agrees on, in which case everybody's a panentheist and they're like, well, that, that can't be right. Or it reduces back to the claim about how God's the foundation of reality, how things just necessarily emanate from God. So trying to find any that, so filling out that catchy panentheistic slogan, that's, that's what I find really vague and difficult. Um, yeah. I mean, well, it's just a matter of how you interpret the phrase perhaps. So, uh, if, pan, if being a panentheist or if whatever we are as Harry Krishna just means we think God is never alone, uh, then that's obviously acceptable. Like, um, so, like there's the, the Chatur Shloki of the Bhagavatam, which are said to be the four seed verses. So these four verses uh, were instructed to Lord Brahman. That was the whole Bhagavatam. He was so elevated that he could understand the Bhagavatam just by those four verses. We need uh, 18,000 verses to, to get close to understanding it um but in one of those verses it said you know before creation i existed during creation only i exist and after creation only i exist uh of course well what does that mean so uh <clears throat> you w w look into this word i you know who's speaking god so what is this i uh and then you get you know just just like if you say oh you know i saw the king 
uh, this is an analogy that was given in ancient India or traditional India. What does it mean if you saw the king? Does it mean, you know, the king was just there all by himself, you know, just like walking past in the bushes? No. If you saw the king, you saw his whole entourage, you know, the army there to protect him, you know, palanquins, everything. Just like, you know, I, I heard a speaker explaining this and said, of course, Barack Obama would have been president at the time this lecture was given. You know, if you say, if you see Barack Obama, you know, even if it looks like he's alone, there are at least four, you know, secret service men hiding in the bushes ready mm -hmm. to protect him and so on. Um, so this idea of God never being alone is definitely there in our tradition. And so are you happy to say that's all it could mean to be a panentheist? That seems right to me, but the typical panentheist gets really annoyed if I say that's all it is, uh, because they're like, no, 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 no. Like there's, there's gotta be something more to this catchy slogan. So here's some of the work I've done to try to fill out the catchy slogan of the universe is in God, but God's more than the universe. Uh, so one suggestion I made in a, in an earlier paper that I've been asked to write on more is this claim that, um, you could say space and time are divine attributes. So absolute space and absolute time are divine attributes. And, and so all this cosmic stuff, you and me and the trees and everything else, mm -hmm. they quite literally exist in space and in time. And so then you could say, well, yeah, the universe and all this stuff exists in God, but God's more than the universe because the things that happen in time, they come and they go and um, they move around, they change and everything, but space, time, they remain. Uh, if those are attributes of God, um, then we're literally in God. So there's a way to cash out the catchy panentheistic slogan. I haven't quite figured out how you, how you do that with space, but with time, I can, I can say more. So within the, um, uh, the Nyaya Vashika school of, of Indian thought, a lot of them are, uh, not a lot, but quite a few are really interested in affirming um, this absolute theory of time, which says that time is this eternal, uncreated substance. Uh, so it's it's not the sort of thing that God could create. And it's the substance that makes change possible. It explains why things exist at the present. Uh, it explains um, relationships between past, present, and future. So that, time is this thing that's done all that. I think that word's nyaya vaisheshika. Vaisha, okay, yeah, because my pronunciation is going to be terrible yeah, on all yeah, of this. That's fine. I just thought I'd get that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So say, 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 that, say it again. Vaisheshika. Vaisheshika. Yeah. Okay. Um, gosh, ugh. I struggle with these, and then I'm in Finland right now, and I struggle with all the Finnish pronunciations. This is just, you know, it's not a good year for me to talk. Okay. So here's the, so the, so you get this guy named uh, Raghunata Shiramani who uh, sees these sort of claims, and he's like, this is a really bloated ontology. I've got a whole bunch of eternal, uncaused substances just floating around in the world. That's too much stuff. I've got, I've got God. I've got time. I've got space. I've got the ether. I've got a bunch of other like eternal, uncaused substances. And he's like, "What can I do to like make my ontology less bloated?" He's like, "Well, God could do all of this stuff. God's an eternal, uh, uncaused substance that makes change possible. God explains why things exist at the present. God explains." Um, the temporal relations between events and stuff because the way God's like sustaining and providentially ordering the world. So time just is God. It's an attribute of God. It's a mode of God. And so there we go. Uh, and so that's one way you could try to cash out this catchy panentheistic slogan. As you say, the universe exists in time. Well, God is time. The universe is not identical to time. Um, so, you know, God is more than the world. So the universe is in God, but God is more than the world. That'd be one way to go to try to cash out the, uh, can't, the catchy panentheistic slogan. So as Harry Krishnas, we want to say that there's a different sense of identity that God has with the material energy than what he has with his holy name, with his deity form, with his pastimes and so on. So, if you, you know the distinction you're making sounds acceptable to me uh of course it'd be interesting to see what K kenneth valpy has to say yeah. um but yeah that that sounds fine to me as long as we can have some kind of thing that m the material energy is not categorically different from god it's, it's an, an emanation might be a suitable word we use the word shakti and the word shakti and emanation mm -hmm. might be synonymous perhaps or at least correlate to one another 
Yeah. So when you're looking at the, the this energy sort of stuff, you're going to be looking also need to flesh out the claim that, that space is an attribute of God. That I don't understand as well because I don't understand the philosophy of space as well. Um, so I know that absolute space is a major theme in some schools within the Indian philosophy, but not all. Uh, and it looks like it's this eternal uncaused substance that ex- that explains why there's all these locations where things could be placed. And so what you'd have to do if you want to make space an attribute of God is say, God is this eternal uncaused substance and that just kind of generates all of these locations. And so we're literally located here, there, or wherever. And those are locations generated by the essence of God or are just locations in God. Um, is, is, is the, yeah, you might have to spell that out. But I don't understand this as well because space, I find, uh, it's just it's just not something I understand very well. Right. Um, what, what was it you were saying about the Nyaya Vaisheshika school? Did I distract you by it with the pronunciation? Uh, no. So the, the claim I was saying was they had uh, a, a long tradition of saying absolute space and absolute time that they had that in their ontology. And then this guy named uh, Raghunata Shiramani in that same tradition said that's a very bloated ontology. So what if we reduce, uh, we get rid of all these other things and make it all God. So God is space and God is time. Right. Okay. And I think he does the same thing with the ether and, and, and so on. But the time stuff, that's what interests me since that's what my major research topic is at the moment. Okay. And so that would be a way to f- flesh out panentheism more. Right. Shall we move on to pantheism? Or are there any more points? Um, oh, well, I guess I should make one more point about this. So I've made this proposal that you could say panentheism, if they want to c- cash out the catchy panentheistic slogan, you could make space and time attributes of God. Um, some different people who are panentheists, like Philip Clayton, say, yeah, that's good. That's great. Um, that's, the, that's the way to go. Benedict Gurkis did the same similar kind of claim. Um, but then this guy named Carl uh, uh, Pfizer, who is a panentheist, he pointed something out to, uh, in, a, in a paper that I think is right, and I've long had the same suspicion. So here's the claim. He says, any model of God could do that. Any model of God could uh, make space and time attributes of God and still not be panentheistic because they would be affirming things that panentheists don't like, such as creation out of nothing. And I'm like, yep, I can point to various people who do exactly that. So Isaac Newton and Samuel Clark, they want to make space and time attributes of God, and they affirm creation out of nothing. So God has not always existed with a universe or anything. And at some point, God does exist with a bunch of cosmic stuff. Uh, So I think uh, Pfizer's critique of my position, of my way of trying to articulate panentheism, I think it's, it's accurate. It's very accurate. So that's why I keep going back to maybe panentheism. The best I can tell, the clearest statement I can tell is You've got the statement about how God is the foundation of reality, and it's that God has to create. God's always creating, or God's just emanating stuff, so God always exists with stuff. Well, if you want to say there's a sense in which God is identical with the material energy, then you can't say there was ever a time when the material energy didn't exist. Right. So, so that, that yeah, so you've got this foundation reality claim. Difference. Uh, and I mm-hmm. don't think that's a big yeah. difference at all. No, that one's a really clear difference. So you've got this. So what you, that would be really actually that's a really good point. Um, so that would be a really unique claim that you wouldn't see in other models of God. So that and it would be about the nature of God too. So that's so that's real. That's yeah. That's that's a really good point. I like that. I need to write that down actually. <laughs> It'll be useful for some stuff. Yeah. Right. So so then pantheism yeah. or yeah. Let's get on to pantheism. Uh, so is this what the Buddhists and the uh, Shankaracharyas are all into? That's typically the claim. So pantheism, and then sometimes it's called monism. So the claim is, is like, there's sometimes it'll go like this. There's only one substance that exists. That's it. And that one substance is God or what we call God. Is that a person? Some pantheists say yes. Some say no, but they'll typically want to say attributes like, consciousness bliss in some kind of sense um you know omniscience omnipotence these kind of things unless you want to go well maybe that's all just part of the illusion of reality or something but at rock bottom there's just one thing that exists and it's god we might be modes of god uh um, but we're still like constituted or made out of the same stuff that is god 
So at rock bottom, there's just God, and then there's all this other stuff. So there's so there's some kind of identity statement between God and everything else. And that's much stronger than what the panentheist wants to make, because the panentheist wants to go, well, I'm not identical to God. Maybe I'm like, an, like you know, there's some kind of difficult to articulate how that relationship works. So the panentheist goes, yeah, no, it's just God, and you're identical to God. Right. Yeah. Like in Bhagavad, uh, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Mamai Vamso Jiva Loke, the, the living entities in the material world are my eternal parts and parcels. The Sanskrit, uh, Mamai Vamso, uh, has the word Amsa, which means limbs. But the word limb in, in Sanskrit is used much uh, more flexibly than we use it in English. So I was Sanskrit. assuming, yeah. I was, I was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so it doesn't net like literal limbs, but somehow you're an aspect of God in yeah. some way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's different ways to, to develop this. So um, so Andre Bukharev is a contemporary pantheist who's trying to develop this. And so he'll, he'll say, the strict identity stuff, there's no such thing. Instead, there's um, constitution relations. And that's what we really mean by identity. Um, I should probably say what a constitution relation is. So a constitution relation is not identity. It's supposed to be the next best thing. Uh, and so the, the classic example is supposed to be a statue made out of marble. There's two objects there. There's the statue and the marble, but in and but there's still in some sense they're like, it's it's the same thing. There's this this like there's a sameness without identity kind of relation is is, is the claim. So there's one statue, and, but there's the statue and the marble, and it's made out of, and those are two different things, and, and they can take different forms or something like that. So it's a constitution relation. So on some accounts of pantheism, the claim is there's just one substance that's God. Everything else that you see, so all the buildings and all the trees that I see out in front of me at the moment in Helsinki, those are just like constituted out of God, uh, is, 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 is how you go on uh, Andre's account of pantheism. Um, on Spinoza's account and some others that I've seen, the claim is not a constitution relation, but a mode relation. So God is like a carpet, is the analogy you get. So God's like a carpet or a rug, and there might be bumps in the carpet. You can flatten them out and then maybe like put a bump up somewhere else. Um, but those are all just modes of the carpet. It's just the carpet. But you and I and everything else are just bumps in the carpet. Right. So is that like saying the universe is composed of God? Is that what you mean by constitution? Yeah. If you wanted to go the constitution route, yeah, you'd be saying the universe is composed of God. Like the substance is God. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. You know, when you're walking, you're walking on God, which would be kind of disrespectful, you'd think. You might think it's disrespectful. Um, I don't think, I, knowing Andre, I don't think he'll care. He'll be like, ah, whatever, who cares? Um, uh, right. But you're also, your feet are made of God. Uh, so oh, oh, right. it's God, okay. God stuff, walking on God stuff. Yeah, because for- What's for, the big deal? For Harry Christians, it's kind of like feet are really disrespectful. You know, you don't point your feet at the deity. You don't point your feet at other people. Like you don't sit all sprawled out with your feet pointing at someone. And when someone's exalted, you'll place your feet at their head. You know, you'll bow down. And, and that's, that's a way. Oh, I see. It's, it's a high degree of respect. And, you know, you take the foot dust from the pure devotee or the foot dust from the deity kind of thing. And there's even prayers. I want to be placed as one of the, part of the uh, particles at the lotus feet of, of Krishna. Um, mm -hmm. so we, we want to make it, we want to say there's a difference between, you know, some things and other things. So when I walk, I'm not walking on God. Uh, but you know, I don't put my feet on the deity. I don't point my feet at the de deity. I don't put my feet on the pure devotee. I don't point my, yes. And so on. Uh, so you, you want to say there's some kind of difference with pantheism. I, it seems to be like, if God is the universe, then does God even exist? Is, is that, is it? Is that going too far? It so That's, sounds like atheism to me. There are um, debates about that exact point. So, so some people will say, I'm a pantheist, um, but of a naturalistic sort, and which just means just atheism. Um, <laughs> and, and then there's some others who are like, well, it's a religious naturalism, so it's not just atheism. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Um, but then there are others, like if you want to go with like, like Shankar's account, though, um, the idea like that there's this universe and all this other stuff, and that's just part of the illusion, right? I mean, at rock bottom, it's just, there's just God. So the only reason I think that there's this universe and all this other contingent stuff, that's just part of an illusion, and I need to get get over that. 
I think using the word God for what Shankaracharya is describing is deceptive and really inaccurate mm. because when we say God, we, we, we mean the person. I'm pretty sure if you look it up in the dictionary, it'll say the supreme person or something along those lines, right? The supreme being maybe. But mm -hmm. what Shankar is talking about is something that doesn't have any qualities. And that doesn't sound yeah. it's not a yeah. person. He denies that it's a person. And, and, and you know, we, we are said to be identical with that, you know, that one of the, uh, his epistemology is to have mahavakyas, which are, are phrases that he argues are the the truest statements from the Vedas. So you, you take those statements, they're absolute truth, and anything in the Vedas that doesn't fit with them, you just twist it till it fits. That's his hermeneutic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've seen this accusation a lot, and I, I can't judge because I don't understand the, the text well enough, but it the, the, the evidence I've seen given, it does look like there's a lot of twisting going on. I, I so I so I, I'm I would find that very plausible. Well, to, uh, that accusation. To be fair, we we do something else, but we do it a bit differently. We have the yoga ladder. So the yoga ladder is Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So Brahman you might call impersonal. It's it's you could, it's God's impersonal features. So what Shankaracharya is talking about does in fact exist. There is an impersonal effulgence which you can merge with temporarily you'll eventually get bored. This, you know, like the Buddhists talk about the, the bodhisattvas, they've attained the spiritual perfection. Mm -hmm. They've reached the Brahman effulgence in our terminology. It's, it's a, the, the descriptions match up perfectly, but then they get bored and they come down here to do welfare work because the nature right. of the soul is act, to be active, to, to be engaged in service. So only when you go to the spiritual world where you can be actively serving Krishna, can you remain eternally. Right. Okay. Yeah. So within the Hare Krishna tradition, there's much more of an emphasis on God being a person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the yoga than, than Shankar's so, ever going to allow for. And then, so yeah. that's the impersonal feature. Then there's a Paramatma, which is Krishna in the whole, so in, in the heart, sorry, mm. the super soul in the heart. Uh, and you might compare this to the Holy Ghost, perhaps. You know, Krishna's in the heart, giving us instructions, witnessing our suffering, our, tri our tribulations, watching us the whole time is compared to two birds in a tree. I've even heard this compared mm -hmm. to Adam and Eve, you know, saying Adam and Eve is a metaphor and the fruit in the tree. So there's statements in the one of the Upanishads or Puranas that two birds in a tree, one of them is eating the fruit and the other one's watching. The, the fruit is, you know, at the attempts to enjoy the material energy and the bird, you know, being God, the paramatma in the soul and the heart is waiting for when we're going to turn to God, you know, find God in the heart and, you know, return to him. And so, yeah, this, this connection with Adam and Eve, it, it, it's, it, it's an interesting one. There are like some parallels, you know, there's the fruit. But on this view, Adam is compared to God, the, the super soul, I think. And, and Eve's hmm. the one who ate the fruit first, right? And 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 Hare Krishna theology, it said that there's a sense in which all souls, Jiva souls, are feminine in relationship to God. You know, so God's Purusha and we're Prakriti. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I need to think about that some more. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a bit yeah, wacky for someone yeah. who hasn't heard that explanation of Adam and Eve before, but... Uh, no, no. Anyway, but yeah, you just need to think about that. That's a tangent. So I was talking about the yoga ladder. So when <clears> we find statements in the Shastra which talk about God being impersonal, we say that's talking about the Brahman feature. When we find statements that talk that, that fit with the Paramatma exp explanation, we say that's fitting with Paramatma. And then when we find the Bhagavan explanation, we say this is describing Bhagavan and Bhagavan is the highest because Bhagavan contains all the other qualities in full. So, you know, when, when you enter the spiritual world, there's no longer Krishna in the heart because Krishna's in front of you personally. Um, it's only in the material world that you have Krishna in the heart. Uh, mm, okay. And, yeah, Bhag and Bhagavan, had, you know, it said that the Brahman, the Brahma Jyoti is the effulgence coming off of Krishna's body. So Bhagavan has all qualities in full. And, you know, Anselm's argument, you know, God is that being than which no greater being can be imagined. Or, you know, some pe people tell me off and say, Anselm wouldn't have used the word being because God isn't a being. He's the uh, the ground of all being, which is not himself a being. But that's, we discussed that early in the, in the podcast. And that's a Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever that means. But anyway, so if, you know, ba this Bhagavan seems like it, with Anselm's argument would get us there because, you know, the, you know, that mm -hmm. actually Rupa, uh, Jiva Goswami gave a very similar argument that Bhagavan means full in all opulences. Krishna is, displays all of the opulences to the highest degree. There's six opulences me mentioned, you know, riches, beauty, 
and so on. Um, and so, yeah, we, we got there because we were talking about hermeneutics because I was I was saying how mm. Shankaracharya twists statements to fit his Mahavakyas. And I was doing that because I wanted to say one of his Mahavakyas was Tatam Asi, thou art that. So it said we are that same <laughs> divine energy or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's you know, they, these are that uh, Nirvachaniya crowd who say the it's, it's ineffable. We can't describe the absolute truth. So we can only gesture at it imperfectly. Um, but they're saying, so when we attain spiritual perfection, it's not that we merge into this perfected spiritual state or per perfect being or whatever. It's just that we remember our true identity. This, the, so, you know, to get it precise. Oh, right. So, that, mm -hmm. you know, because if you say, you know, I merged back into God, that means there was two things. It was me right. and God, and then I merged, and now there's one thing. But the the Shankaracharya follower wants to argue that there are no two things. There's only one thing, and this one thing has no qualities. It's there's just the illusion of qualities. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so something you said reminded me of this argument I've developed in a forthcoming paper on panentheism. So I was asked to write this this paper uh, for this book on models of God and what's called axiology or value. So the question is, uh, should we want God to exist? And that's been something that's been debated in some philosophy of religion for a while. Uh, and so this particular book is going to go, well, what kind of God would, would we want to exist? What kind of, would it be better if a panentheistic God existed than like say like a classical theistic God? Uh, or maybe it would be better if a classical theistic God uh, existed. So what kind of value or disvalue would come with a particular model of God? And so what I tried to do was argue, maybe a panentheist, maybe they can. There's ways they can show that they're they've got more value uh, added to the world than any of the other models of God. And so when it came to panentheism versus pantheism, here's an argument I looked at. So uh, uh, Andre Bukharev, who I mentioned earlier, wants to argue from God's uh, maximal empathy to uh, pantheism, and I want to go. No, you can't do that. So um, there's this attribute called omnisubjectivity or maximal empathy, which claims that for any creaturely conscious state, God uh, has a perfect empathetic grasp of that state. So he knows what it's like for you to have that uh, experience. Maybe it's a painful experience, maybe it's a pleasurable experience, whatever it is. And so Andre tries to move from God having that attribute to pantheism. And so the idea is, well, how could I know what it's really like to be you unless I am you? Uh, is, is the move. What I do is I say, well, that's not empathy anymore because empathy is knowing what it's like for somebody else to feel a particular way. I know what it's like for Arjuna to feel a particular way. And you know what it's like for Ryan to feel a particular way. It's not me feeling a particular way. It's knowing what it's like for you to feel a particular way. And then I can have certain feelings based on that. I might, um, you know, like go, okay, I feel bad too because you feel bad or, Actually, you know, you deserve that. So, uh, so I'm not, I, don't, I don't feel bad for you. Um, there's different ways. There's different empathetic reactions. So empathy assumes, and it has built into it, the idea that there are two people there, not one. Mm. So what I do to push back against um, certain moves uh, from God's uh, maximal empathy to pantheism is to just go, you've misunderstood what empathy is. Because empathy, I can't empathize with myself. And if pantheism is true then God couldn't have empathy because God's the only person there, the only self there that exists. There's no other selves. Um, so when you're talking about like moving up the ladder, uh, where I actually have some sort of like actual like full personal encounter with, with, with Krishna, I'm like, right, there's, there's two people there. Uh, and you couldn't have that if I'm identical to Krishna. I mean, I, I, I couldn't have that kind of, I couldn't move up the ladder in that sort of way. Yeah. So it seems like if those are really good things, if those are really accurate descriptions, you can't move from that to pantheism. So all those all those sort of uh, arguments to pantheism, I think, are blocked. Oh yeah, they're based yeah. on confusion. The the, the uh, Advaita Vadis, they they don't accept the yoga ladder, or or if mm -hmm. they do, right. they've, they've got it inverted. They've got mm -hmm. like Krishna when you know, I mean, you get this. I mean, you've got Neo Vedanta, which is total nonsense in terms of any of the the traditions from india neo vedanta is what most hindus today believe and what most people when they think of hinduism think of uh it was popularized by uh i can't remember the name vivekananda 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the Ramakrishna mission, uh, they might be a little different. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not super, I'm not a scholar and all this stuff, but yeah, Vivekananda did not study the Vedas. He popularized what they wanted to do was say, India has one religion. Let's compete with the Christians. Let's have one religion. Uh, so what version are we going to have that everyone will be happy with? We'll have Shankaracharya, which a lot of people debated heavily for hundreds of years. <laughs> so to say <laughs> this is going to be the one thing for everyone didn't work. And then they took that and then they gave their own version of it in order to make it so they could fit all the versions of Hinduism into this one thing. So what they ended up with is, you know, Ganesh, Kali, you know, Durga, all of these personalities, Krishna, Rama, they're all just faces that the divine wears so that we can connect to him until we're advanced enough that we can meditate on the qualityless Brahman effulgence mm -hmm. uh, on, on, and once we get to that stage, then we, we move beyond all of these faces and forms and stuff and we reach the impersonal perfection. Uh, right. Okay. So I can see why you'd say the ladder is inverted. Yeah. 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 And for us, that is highly offensive. You know, it, it goes to the point where Sri Chaitanya, who is understood in our tradition to be a recent incarnation of God who appeared in West Bengal 500 years ago, said that, you know, anyone who hears this, these teachings, this impersonal teachings, uh, their bhakti is ruined. You know, we shouldn't mm. even hear this stuff because it's so offensive uh, that we have this concept of a, a Mayavadi and a Brahmavadi. So a Brahmavadi is someone who's attained realization of the impersonal features of God. But when they come in contact with teachings or with, you know, direct experience of the personal features of God, they accept it. But they take shelter of it. They, they, uh, like there's, there's this... Uh, uh, um, Atma, was it Atma Rama? Atma Rama verse. So the Atma Rama, one way God's glorified in Bhagavatam is to say even the Atma Ramas get pleasure from God. So an Atma Rama is someone who's totally self-satisfied. So you offer them, you know, wealth, woman, any kind of pleasure from the material world. They're not interested. Mm -hmm. They're getting a higher pleasure from the self. But when this person comes in contact with bhakti, they'll take to it because because bhakti devotion to God is a higher pleasure. Uh, so the, the Brahmavadi is someone who's advanced spiritually, but just doesn't know about Krishna. Whereas the Mayavadi is someone who's heard about Krishna and has, a, uh, has an understanding of Krishna, which is antithetical to bhakti. And that's to be avoided. Okay. 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 I think, I, I think I kind of followed that. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, I got to think about these things more. Cause like I said before, um, yeah. Getting into Indian philosophy, I'm still very much an amateur on this. Yeah. So like antithetical to bhakti in the sense that this, like, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm having a personal relationship with Krishna and here you are telling me, oh, Krishna's not real. That mm -hmm. This is just a stepping stone. <laughs> and like a stepping stone. Like one time, uh, Prabhupada, who was the founder of the Hare Krishna movement in the West, you know, the, the, the founder, Acharya, the great guru of the Hare Krishna movement. He was with, you know, his young disciples and some of his hotshot disciples, uh, and, you know, one of them held his hand to help him, you know, as an old man walk up a hill or, you know, step up to something when they're out on a morning walk. And then Prabhupada, you know, said, you know, then Carlson Ray said, now I don't need you anymore. So this is the impersonalist understanding of the guru and of Krishna that it's a stepping stone. So, you know, the guru will also, the, the, the disciple of a guru in this impersonal tradition will also seek to surpass their guru and get rid of them. You know, like now I don't need you. Anymore. Now I'm guru. Now I pass that stage and you know cast the guru off. It's the same kind of thing. Whereas you know, we want to say the the, the guru. Has, I have an eternal eternal debt to them because they've given me this priceless gem of Krishna bhakti, uh, and they're always I'm always lower to, than them as a result. Even if somehow or other I might become more advanced than them, I'm always less than them because they've given me something priceless. And so this that's like personal relationships are so important. So this idea that the guru and Krishna are both stepping stones so we can get to a real impersonal understanding is highly offensive. And also, you know, it's kind of like, you know, taking the, taking the gems and throwing them away and playing with the box. From That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Cause they were like, here's this priceless gem. And then you'd be like, it's not really that priceless. Is it? Cause I just 
get rid of it. Um, yeah, yeah, I can see why that would, I can see now why that would be really offensive because you're like, my goal is to be in this beautiful relationship with Krishna. Ow, but no, that's not really the real goal. That's just uh, just one step along the way. Get rid of all of that. Yeah, so this, yeah, I can see why you would, you would not want that at all. Yeah, I'm going off on tangents, but I, I guess this is mm-hmm. not related. No, it is, it is. Yeah. So at this point, we've covered all the models of God. Was there any other question you wanted to hit on? Because um, I know at some point you wanted to do uh, like a dialogue after. Um, right, yeah. Uh, I don't know how much time, time, more time you've got. We've, we've been at, at two hours. I can give you about five minutes uh, if you want. Right. So I can do another question if you want. There was one more point I wanted to make on that last topic, but it slipped my mind when I was listening to you. Um, hmm. So, yeah. So the, I'm just quickly wondering if the thing is debated and the Indian traditions are, are in any way the same things that have been debated in the Western traditions. So debating whether God has qualities or is completely devoid of all qualities, you know, and whether God is a person or is not a person because uh, an absolute which has no qualities cannot be a person just as it cannot be an effulgence or a warm fuzzy bliss or anything else. Yeah. So whether or not God has qualities, that is a huge debate because simplicity was just assumed for most of the Christian tradition. Uh, But most of the Christian tradition also said that personhood is a perfection and we have to predicate of God. So that one doesn't really get debated until you get to much more recent history. Um, Most of the history that I'm aware of where you start seeing claims about God being the absolute, not being a person and whatnot, a lot of that is kind of after the Western world really has a, a deep interaction with uh, the, the the Indian philosophical context. And so then you start seeing a, a bunch of this stuff about maybe there's the absolute, maybe it's a non-personal thing. And then some people go, no, it is personal. And so you see those kind of debates towards the end of the 1800s and early 1900s and so on. So it's really after a Christian encounter with, with, with like, well, what we call Hinduism now. Um, so yeah, so the personhood thing doesn't really get debated a whole lot, but the, does God have qualities? That's a huge debate. Um, because, uh, so in the Islamic tradition, for instance, Al-Ghazali looks at this claim that God has no attributes, no qualities. And he says, there's first, that's just incoherent. That makes no sense. Second, there's this thing called the Quran, which gives a whole bunch of different names of God and identifies a bunch of different attributes that God has. If God has none of these things, then what is this Quran doing over here? Like, what's it saying? Uh, and so he's just like, we got to reject this. And we should say that God is unified in that way that I talked about earlier. So God has attributes. Um, so yeah, those are, those are big debates. The sort of debates I think that might be different, that you don't see as much, they're going to be debates about things that... Um, not necessarily exactly the model of God, but things within your theological system that are going to impact the model of God. Um, so how invested is God in the universe? So the way that's going to manifest in the Christian tradition is going to be, is God impassable or not? The way that's going to manifest in some of the different Indian traditions is, well, if God's got various desires to make the world be a particular way, is God going to have karma? Because typically we don't want to say God's got karma. So you're going to see it kind of pan out that way. Um, Ah, no, here's one debate that I think is really fascinating that I see pop up in Western traditions and Eastern traditions. It's about omniscience and timelessness. So I find this really fascinating because that's my main area of work, that this objection is just so obvious to people. If God really knows all things, he needs to be able to know the temporal facts, like what's happening right now. Uh, And if he's timeless, he can't know what's happening right now because what's happening right now is constantly changing when God would be constantly changing. So this is an objection that you see pop up in the in the Western traditions, but then also in the Eastern traditions. So a bunch of people who want to deny the existence of God, so different Jainas, um, uh, different uh, Mimamsas and whatnot, different uh, philosophers in these traditions, they'll look at arguments for the existence of God from uh, other Indian philosophical systems, and they'll give these arguments of like, but your concept of God's incoherent because you couldn't have an omniscient being that's timeless. So you couldn't give an argument for the existence of God because the exist because the concept of the very idea of God is just incoherent. So, you, so those kind of sort of debates you see in, uh, I think, a lot of different religious traditions. And everyone debates works versus grace. 
Yes, that pops up a lot. Uh, it, it has a different flavor and different texture because of the different ways the religious doctrines go. But yeah, basically works versus uh, versus grace. Um, and then how much determination is going on in the world to is the determination from karma make it such that I don't have free will uh, or is God really determining a whole bunch of stuff such that I don't have free will? Cause you see that in some different uh, thinkers in both um, Indian context and uh, Western context. So there are, there is some overlap in interests, um, but then there's also some interesting differences because there's some different religious doctrines at play. The analogy I like for works versus grace is uh, if it's grace, then we're like, the baby monkey oh sorry no if it's if it's works then we're like the baby monkey who has to hold on to the mother as the mother hurdles through the trees and if that baby monkey lets go it'll hurdle down and possibly die Mm -hmm. whereas the grace would be if we're like the kitten who is carried in the mouth of the mother so oh okay because his knees is not dependent upon me hanging on uh, yeah, at that yeah. Point. The, the kitten's just yeah, carried. right, right, right. Okay. The kitten doesn't have to ha- hang on; it's just carried. Um, so, the, and the, the Hare Krishna tradition argues that it's works and grace. Y- you both have mm. to do something and get God's mercy, which I think makes the most logical sense. It seems like it. I mean, that's that seems to me. Whereas all the different denominations within Christianity, they're constantly playing around with. You need to do some stuff, but it's all grace we still need to do some stuff and it gets messy really fast because uh, nobody wants to be accused of these different heresies. Um, whereas it just seems really obvious that God has to give you some grace and he expects you to do some stuff too. Like that's, I, that seems obvious to me. That's, that's what's going on in, in the new Testament, but if it, yeah. I mean, I don't know. If, if it's all grace, then you've got this major problem of evil. Why are some people not getting the mercy? Well, I, th- I think it goes further than further than that. Is is if it's all grace, um, why yeah, why are certain people getting mercy? But then also, why put us through any of this? If, <laughs> yeah, if God can just snap exactly. his fingers and just give me all this grace that makes me like morally perfect for, from the start, then why why put up with all of this world? So I, I think it really exacerbates the problem of evil in a very very serious way. Well, I think what you just said there is a big objection to major aspects of Christianity too, like. Jesus saved us by, by his sacrifice on the cross. So it's like, okay, why didn't he just do that in the beginning before putting us through this material creation? Why do we even have to take birth in this horrible material world at all if we're already can be saved by Christ just through a single act of grace? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah. so yeah, I, I think certain theories of the atonement, just just they just lay open the door for that kind of objection. Um, whereas other accounts of atonement and other accounts of the incarnation, um, so like John Scotus has John Dun Scotus has this uh, this view where the incarnation would happen no matter what. Uh, it's 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 not primarily about atonement. Uh, it's primarily about like friendship because that's God's ultimate goal. And so one way, a very good way, not the only way, but one good way to achieve friendship with humanity is through incarnations and theophanies and these sort of things. Uh, so it's it's one step towards furthering God's goal for creation. Right. So yeah, it depends on your theory of the atonement. Um, but yes, you're right. Some theories of the atonement are going to just they're just going to land right in the objection that you just laid out. The only theory of the atonement which I can make any sense of is moral influence theory, or through a Hare Krishna lens, bhakti influence theory. Mm-hmm. It I think it's the easiest one to figure out when you start looking at more claims of like uh, Christ being a substitute, then it gets messy really fast because so many people mean different things by in what sense is Christ a substitute for you? Um, is he being punished for you? Is he just making things sacred in some kind of way? Cause that's what it quite literally means to be a sacrifice is to make something sacred. It gets very messy and the new Testament itself, I don't think gives a very clear story. Hence why you get all these theories, of the atonement. Many Christian thought. Right. Um, so one thing I would find very interesting is to have someone do an analysis of the arg- arguments given against Shankaracharya's views and see what those same arguments do for classical theism. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I had this thought the other day. So uh, Roy Parrott's um, uh, Cambridge Introduction to Indian Philosophy, he's got a section where he's got these objections to, uh, um, where he's looking at objections to, to uh, Sean Crow's view. And some of them look like they're just ripe for developing objections to classical theism. So yeah, I, I do think at some point that would be an interesting analysis. You know? Which would uh, fit with my idea that um, Shankaracharya's views is just classical theism taken all the way to its extreme and uh, robustly or exhaustively detailed. seems his weak internet connection has gone all right yeah he's got bad internet so we'll wrap up there um we've done enough time anyway so thanks for tuning in um again if you like this kind of stuff be sure to subscribe let us know what you think down in the comments and i'll see you on the next stream Hare krishna mm -hmm.